The Psalms are a well-worn collection of songs, hymns, and prayers that speak to the human experience. Life is not a level path. In this world, we will experience joy, sorrow, anger, shame, love, jealousy, hope, and more. Emotions are a gift and a part of our God-given design. But how do we direct these emotions and keep our eyes fixed on God in the highs and lows of life? King David authored many psalms, and we will learn how to steward our lives well in the highest highs and the lowest lows as we study through some of his greatest hits. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Um, we're going to be reading out of Psalms 86. If you guys would like to find it and join me and stand if you're able, that'd be wonderful. Okay. Great is your steadfast love, a prayer of David. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods. O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things, you alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love towards me. You have delivered me from my soul from the depths of Sheol. O oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strengths to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Every time, you always give the best good morning. Not that I'm picking favorites or anything, but some of you could try a little harder, maybe. That's what I'm saying. It's a good start. <laughs> uh, we're continuing this morning in our, our summer mixtape series, and actually this morning we are coming to the end of our summer mixtape series, uh, which um, I'm both excited for and sad for, and I want to encourage you uh, that just because we're finishing with the Psalms doesn't mean that you can just kind of tuck this away uh, and never look at the Psalms again. Hopefully, this has sparked a new love for you, uh, and you've seen actually the reality that the Psalms are, are practicing prayer for us. Uh, that they give us words when we feel like we have none, when we are in the depths of pain or shame or sorrow. Uh, David and so many of the other psalmists have been there with us. Uh, and so they give us words to guide us and to keep our aim and our affection towards the Lord. Um, and so this morning we come to Psalm 86. Uh, and, and as I was reading through this, there's kind of this one uniting theme uh, that we see as the hinge here. Um, it's, it's a verse that actually we, we looked at when we started this series way back, uh, but it got this idea of one, one, one heart, the wholeness of who we are. Uh, in 1991, uh, U2, uh, a band some of you may know, I don't know, uh, they, they came out with their song, One. It was one of their, still is, one of their biggest hits. It's been covered by so many different people, uh, and it continues to speak in, in some incredible ways. But what I didn't realize was the story of actually when they recorded that song and what lay behind it. 
Because back in 1990, on October 3rd, they were flying into Germany where they would be recording this album that they were going to put together. Now, October 3rd, for most of you, probably doesn't mean a whole lot. For my family, it means a lot. That's when Ella was born, was October 3rd. But this particular day, October 3rd, 1990, was the day in Germany of their reunification. The Berlin Wall, the East and West, no longer was there a divide. There was one people. And as the, the band U2 was coming in and they were driving to the studio, they could see the celebration throughout the streets of Germany. Now, you hear that and you think, ah, that's probably what was behind this whole idea of, of one. And yet it could be the furthest thing from the truth because the band at the time was experiencing a, a fractioning and, and they were feeling a strife between one another. They were bigger than life at that time and they were wrestling with their fame. And so they came in to record this album with all sorts of grief and sorrow and personal loss. And they, they were anything but one. And actually it's Part of what makes the song so powerful is it speaks to this longing to be one, this longing to feel whole, this longing for completeness. I think it's why it's transpired over generations that people still continue to come back to this song. And for us this morning, I feel like this elusiveness of wholeness as something that we are still feeling the tension of. Because if you look around, we are fractured and we are divided. And I'm not just talking externally, right? We talk a lot about that, that we look at our country today, we look at our, our, uh, our own state, we look at all these different things and we see just a fracturing of people. We feel the tension in certain relationships that once were close that no longer are. But that's not even the fracturing I'm talking about. There's not a, just an external fracturing. There's an internal fracturing. Our minds are consuming more data daily than we can actually process. We have more images. We have more information coming at us all the time. So much so that our ability to, to be outraged, right? We're exhausted with it because we're always is supposed to be angry with something new and we never have time to really settle the last battle before the new battle begins and we're being told just how we should be responding over and over and over again. We've seen that there's wars, there's rumors of wars. And before we uh, were faced with the death and destruction of, of true wars, the news cycle's already moved on and, and we're already caring about something else. It has blown my mind personally how affected I was at watching the images in Afghanistan only to have them quickly replaced by whatever the news was at the time and then to be transfixed on what was happening in Ukraine and it's still happening and we just don't talk about it because, well, the news cycle continues on and it's just grabbing hold of you and our attention and our ability to focus is just so all over the map. We're on to the next conspiracy, the next project, the next soccer game, school rhythms, all these things, they come and the next and the next and the next is always here so we can hardly sit still with what we already have. And so here I am this morning trying to get a hold of your attention for just a moment, knowing that when we sit still long enough, we, we can't bring our fractured mind together because we're thinking of so many things. And then on top of that, we have a device that sits in our pocket that dings and vibrates and is constantly making sure that we know we are accessible 24-7. Even in this space, how often do we laugh as someone's phone goes off in the middle of service because we're, we're always on. And some of you are sitting here today and you're not even thinking about what I'm saying because you're like, I... I'm already thinking my to-do list. I'm already thinking about what we're going to do tomorrow. I'm already thinking about what's coming up this week. You've got all these things that are there, and you're like, was this guy going to get to his point? Because I have things to do, <laughs> right? And maybe you're one of the few that's sitting here this morning, and you're like, I don't feel any of that. Well, then let me just tell you, you're behind. <laughs> I don't know on what, but you are. And that little anxiety that's creeping up, it's valid, and you need to chase it. <laughs> Let it consume you. So what do we do with our fractured selves? 
What do we do with a mind that is frayed in so many directions that it's exhausting? Well, we began this look at the Psalms by taking a line from this very Psalm, verse 11. It's, it's one of David's greatest hits. And it's a line that speaks not to just a, a momentary uh, decision. It's, it's a mindset that David is speaking to here. A way of life that's centered and united around God. And so we hear David see, say in verse 11, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. See, what David is praying for and what he's praying towards and what we've seen throughout the Psalms that he's singing towards and he's writing towards is that he wants to have a rightly ordered heart, one that is united to fear God and to stand in awe of who God is above all others. And what we've seen in the Psalms is that they, they speak to our human experience. They speak to our pain, our rejoicing, our distress, our depression. It speaks to the ups and downs that we all experience, the hard and the easy. But what we see in David is that he is continually fighting to unite his heart to fear God above all else above his own fear, above his own despair, above his own loss, his own shame, his own pride, his own sin, his striving. And that's been our aim as we've made our way through these psalms that we would continue to rightly order our affections and our attention towards God. But the question still remains, knowing that we all have a million tabs up on our computer screen of our mind all the time, how do we unite our heart to fear God's name? Because we are divided in attention, fragmented in thinking. We play in the shallows all the time when we were designed to live in the deep. So how do we unite our hearts to fear his name? To give full strength to that which matters. That, may we, that we may walk in him and with him and for him. And so as we use Psalm 86 as our guide, I just want to begin by praying a portion of this psalm as our prayer. That we would allow in these moments God just to settle our hearts, to unify our fractured minds just for a moment to focus on what he has for you this morning. So you pray with me. Father, we come before you grateful for who you are. Lord, we all come carrying our, our prior week. We, we see the week that is ahead. We have unchecked boxes, unreturned emails, things that are demanding our attention, and yet, Lord, I pray in this moment that you would quiet our minds. That we would hear from you. That your word would come front and center, shaping us and guiding us. So, Lord, we join with David. We, we pray, teach us your way, O Lord. That we may walk in your truth. Unite our hearts to fear your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you have a, a Bible with you, you can follow along with me. We're going to work through Psalm 86. And from the jump, we see that the header here is, is pretty simple. It's just a prayer of David. It's simply his prayer, his petition as he's coming before the Lord. And in this Psalm alone, we actually see David make no less than 15 requests, 15 petitions to the Lord. The first verse starts with two, incline your ear, bend your ear towards me and answer me. Would you answer me, Lord? For I am poor and needy. Preserve my life for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you for you are my God. And so right from the jump, we find David where we seem to always find him in the Psalms. A life is not going as planned. Things aren't good. And he's turning to God, trying to turn his aim back towards him. And he's wrestling, God, would you listen to me? Would you answer me? 
Because I'm, I'm poor and needy. David, in this moment, he's acknowledging, I am at a disadvantage here. I do not have the strength to face what I am facing on my own, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need you in a serious way. So would you preserve my life? Would you guard my life? Would you protect me? And he says, protect me for I am godly. I'm one of yours. I've been chasing after you. know I, I'm a man after your own heart. I'm, I'm yours. So save your servant who trusts in you for you are my God. And we're going to see David do some things in this prayer that I think are important for us to take notice of. He's going to come with the reality of his experience, but he's also going to state some things and some truths that he just needs to register for himself. So right here, we see him establishing, you are my God. You are the one I trust. These things that are coming against me that I'm at a deficit to face on my own, I know I can't do it on my own. I I don't have the ability. I need you. And I've seen you show up in the past, and I'm trusting you're going to do it again. So I'm, I'm leaning on you. You are my God. Verse 3, so be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day, glad in the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. David again is saying, be kind to me, be gracious to me, show me mercy, because I'm crying to you. We see that two times here in verses 3 and 4. It's to you, it's to you, Lord. I'm not looking to anything else, I'm looking to you. Now, this is just a a quick little aside, and we've talked about this before when we're looking through Scripture. It's just helpful to understand uh, just this little nuance here. But if you look back up at verse 1, if you're looking at the Scripture in front of you, verse 1, it's going to say, incline your your ear, O Lord. And Lord there is in all caps. It's a little smaller, but it's all capital letters. Uh, Most translations do this as a way of designating that the, the word that's being used there for Lord is Yahweh. It's the the name that God gave Moses. He says, I am that I am. I am Yahweh. I'm the Lord, your God. But we also notice right here in verse 3, it says, be gracious to me, O Lord. And you'll notice that it's not all capitals, but it's the same word. And what this is acknowledging is actually seven times in this passage, we're going to see Lord with the lowercase letters, capital L, but lowercase letters, because the word that's used here is not Yahweh, it's Adonai. Adonai means Lord, it means master, it means sovereign. And what we see in this psalm is that David is acknowledging the sovereignty of God, that he is over all his circumstances, he is over everything, that God is not unaware of what David is is experiencing. I was talking with someone in between services after first service, and they were just kind of going through, talking through something that they were facing. They're like, but you know, it's okay. You know, God is sovereign. I said, yes, he is, but it's also okay. And David has given us a lot of permission to be like, Lord, I hate this. And yet I trust you that you are sovereign. We can speak that. We can acknowledge it. I don't like where things are. And yet, even in the midst of that, I'm going to choose to trust in you. Verse 4, gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. David is saying, I am depressed. Not only am I distressed, I'm depressed. Everything seems dark around me, and I need your joy. I need you to restore uh, my ability to see goodness. And David is not looking to external things here. He's looking to God himself. I need you to gladden the soul of your servant. For to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. This is a phrase that David has spoken before. Psalm 25.1 says the very same thing. And if we look at a pattern throughout the Psalms, uh, another psalmist who wrote one of the Psalm of Ascents, Psalm 121, he says it's slightly different. He says this, I lift my eyes up to the hills, for where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's this acknowledgement of like, I need help that is outside myself, so where am I going to go to? I'm going to go to the one who made everything. I'm going to go to the one who is over all. So to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. And why does David feel confident to do this? Well, he's going to give us some reasons in the midst of all he is facing. Verse 5, it says, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving Abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. You, O Lord, are good and forgiving. Despite my circumstances, despite what I'm experiencing right now, I'm trusting that you are good and forgiving. You are abounding. 
You are overflowing. There is no lack of your steadfast, loyal love that is pursuing me and the love that is available to all who call upon you. Now, when you're in the midst of it, when you are feeling like everything is spiraling, is this your experience of God? Is this like your go-to of like, Lord, you are good, and my life is a tragedy? No. No, we, we cry out of our pain. But what's David doing here? He's acknowledging that I'm, I'm not seeing clearly in the midst of all that's in front of me. And I need to root myself in the truth of who God is. And so where does he go? Because he's not just throwing to get together some words that sound good. He's not just like, I'm just going to cl- claim some things and, and this is who God is in my own image. No, he is rooting himself in Scripture. He's actually rooting himself. We're going to see him. He's going to anchor himself to Exodus 34, 6. It's like the gospel of the Hebrew scriptures. It's one of the most quoted passages throughout scripture. And where does this passage come from? What's the story behind it? Well, if you remember when God chose to free the Hebrew people from Egypt, that he used Moses to be the mediator, that he did great and mighty acts through Moses. And as Moses is is leading the people uh, away from Egypt, there's this moment where Moses is like, God, I just just want to see your face. I just want to see you. And God's like, Moses, you don't know what you're asking for. If you saw my face, you would die, right? Because God is so holy. He's so other. He is so righteous that we can't stand within his presence. And he's like, Moses, you you don't want that. But I tell you what I'll do. I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock. And, and as my glory passes by, I'll, I'll let you see that. It's this beautiful image that God's presence, his glory, a word that means something that carries weight, is so weighty that when he shows up, there's kind of a lingering of his presence. And so as he's coming by, it's this beautiful moment where Moses is looking at the glory, this trail of God's glory, and God is proclaiming who he is to Moses. He says, Moses, you're going to see my glory, and here is who I am. And what does he say? We read this in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. It says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Didn't we just hear some of that? keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. So in this moment where David is experiencing his distress, his despair, his depression, what does he go back to? Not to his current experience. No, he's going back to who God is and who God has said he will be. Because I don't know if your experience is like mine, but when I'm in the midst of distress or despair or depression, I can forget who God is really quick. I can be consumed by the problems that are coming towards me and not see just how good he is, even in the midst of that moment. And so David is not allowing his situation to define who he is. He's allowing the truth of Scripture and the truth of who God is to define his situation. See, that's an important reversal. That we don't allow our problems to become so consuming that it's all we see. We see them and we name them and we're clear about them and they're real. I'm not saying just they're pretend. No, they're real. But we also remember the reality of who God is and what he is capable of. And that he truly is Lord and master and sovereign over all things. So verse 6 and 7, David, uh, coming back to Psalm 86. David says, give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. For in the day of my trouble, I call upon you for you to answer me. David is again, he's staring God in the face instead of just staring at his problem in the face. He's not just lingering there because David knows that staring at his problem is only going to make it bigger. It's only going to make his despair deeper. And it's only going to fracture his heart greater because we've got lots of problems coming at us, don't we? We've got lots of things that we need to solve and fix and get after and, and the projects and a list that never ends and it's, it's there. And so it's always kind of humming in the back of our minds so that we're never fully present to wherever we are. 
So what does David do next? This is the first seven verses is all just kind of David pouring out his heart. And we're going to see that verses 8 through 13 is kind of this praise of David. And he's going to do something unique here. David is, is going to bring his prayer before the Lord. But now David is going to practice uh, what my, my good friend K2 was talking about last week. If you were with us at Church Without a Building, uh, he was talking around this idea of needing to preach to yourself. And David is about to model for us, what does that mean to preach to yourself, to speak truth over yourself in the midst of what you are experiencing? Now, that might sound strange, but I think Paul Tripp says this well. He says, no one is more influential in your life than you are, because no one talks to you as much as you talk to yourself. Right? <laughs> right, we all do this. We all talk with ourselves. We all process through things differently. But we've got this voice that's always with us, speaking to us, and not always good things. Right? We're not always kind to ourselves, are we? Often we can be the, the hardest person in our life to deal with the way that we come after ourselves. And so knowing this, this is why it is so important, so important that we speak the truth of the gospel and the truth of scripture over ourselves. Because we're really good at condemning ourselves. We're really good at coming down on ourselves. We're really good at distorting the situations in front of us. So in the midst of our fractured thinking, we need to begin to unite our thinking around the truth of who God is and who we are in him. And this is what we see David begin to practice and model for us in these next few verses. Verse 8, he says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. Again, David is not just grabbing words out of thin air. This is a direct uh, pull from words that Moses spoke. When Moses saw God move in incredible ways, he, he writes this beautiful poem, this beautiful song in Exodus 15. In Exodus 15, 11, we read these words. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, your majestic and holiness, awesome and glorious deeds, doing wonders? And so what is David doing in this moment? He's acknowledging his problems. They're, they're there, but he's remembering and he's reminding himself of just who God is. He's lifting up his eyes in this moment. There's none like you among the gods, O Lord. Nor are there any works like yours. You are unique among everything. And so I want to look to you. I want to rightly order my attention and my affection and my heart toward you. And he continues, verse 9. He says, All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Sometimes I think David's prayers are declarative, but also he's like reminding himself, like, you alone are God. I believe that. You alone are God. These things coming my way, they are not God. You are God. Like, he's having this conversation with himself. It's the same thing that we need to do. Proclaim truth over ourselves. When our distorted thinking starts to cloud a way forward, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves and declare the truth of Scripture. There's none like you. And David takes it a step further here. He's saying, one day every knee will bow before you. Everything is going to come before God. I love this image because I think it's helpful for us to put some things in perspective. Like whatever thing is just like boring into you right now that you feel like, oh, I'm never, oh, I can't ever get over this hurdle. Whatever that hurdle is, is going to bow its knee before God. Whatever seems to be winning this current cultural moment, whatever seems biggest, whatever seems strongest, whatever we feel most helpless to, all will bow before the true king. You see, that? You see what that does in rightly ordering our hearts? And the voice that we need to pay attention to above all others. That's what David is doing here. My problems are real. Things are coming at me. I'm desperate. I am distressed. But God is still God. And I trust in him. For he is good and he is faithful. And he is abounding in steadfast love. 
So David is taking hold of the song that Moses sang, and now he's singing it himself. And now he's giving us those words that we too can sing them. And then we see at a future moment in heaven, in Revelation 15, these words will get sung again before the throne of God. Revelation 15, 3 through 4 says, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations, King over everything. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For your righteous acts have been revealed. Rightly ordering our hearts. David is uniting himself to fear God's name above his distress, his despair, his depression. He's remembering who the one truly worth worshiping is. That it's God and it's God alone. See, but we all wrestle with lowercase g gods in our lives. Those things that take hold of us and we become subservient to I love how Tim Keller says this. He says, the greatest nightmare of an approval addict is rejection. Of the power addict, it's humiliation. Of the comfort addict, suffering. And of the control addict, uncertainty. And for anyone who suffers from all of those, awesome. (laughs) When our gods are bumped... It reveals what we really worship. When our way is not the way forward, it reveals what we really worship. And in the midst of being bumped, David, with all of these lesser gods demanding his attention, David is reminding himself, he's proclaiming this truth over him of the one who alone is worthy of worship. And once he gets here, that's where I believe we start to take the shift to the very heartbeat and the center of this psalm. As David is preaching and proclaiming to himself who God is, and he's bowing his own knee before him saying, I need to pay attention to you above all other voices. That's where we come to verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. David, in the depths of his distress, despair, and depression, looks at himself. And he's like, I'm not the way forward. I can't do this on my own. And he looks at the true king of kings, and he says, okay, you teach me your way. You show me the path, and I'll follow. You tell me what to do, and I'll, I'll listen. Teach me your way that I may walk in your truth. Not just knowing these truths, but living them. Practicing them. Teach me your way that I may walk in your truth and unite my heart to fear your name. Give me a singular heart that beats for you. Give me a singular heart that beats for you and allow the beat of my heart to beat as yours beats. This is what David is saying in this moment. I want everything consumed by you. I want everything in my life oriented around you. You are priority one. Everything else fits around you and you alone. So all my fears, all my pains, all the things coming at me, I have to start with you because you're the loudest voice I want in my life. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And again, what David is describing here is not just one momentary decision. This is a mindset of walking forward. It's a, it's a way of living, not just a day of living. It's life. This is the better way that God has invited us into to rightly order your heart towards him. To take all of our, our fractured and divided pieces of our thinking, our being, and bring them under him. When I uh, put on these glasses, which this is just always a code for you. You know when I'm tired when I'm wearing my glasses. Um, when, I, when I put on my glasses, um, it affects how I see everything. And if I have the wrong prescription, 
right? Everything is going to be blurry that I'm looking at. So if my prescription's off, my vision's off. In the same way, if I'm allowing my fears to be the lens through which I see everything, then I'm going to see my fears in everything. And if I allow my enemies to be the lens through which I see everything, then I'm going to see my enemies in everything. And what David is pushing us towards and reminding us of is that if God is the lens through which I see everything, then I'm going to see God at work in everything. I'm rightly ordering the way in which I am walking through life with him. I'm bringing everything under him. I'm, I'm sifting everything through him. Now, I know even as I say that, yeah, I, I know how impossible that is. I know how I have good seasons and bad seasons of that. And this is what's so wonderful that God is gracious and merciful and abounding in steadfast love because when our glasses get knocked off, he picks us back up and brushes us off and he helps to realign us once again to pursue him. And so David is saying, unite my heart to fear your name. Don't let all the noise crowd you out. I want to stand in awe of you and of you alone. And when my, my fears, when my despair Whenever's coming at me becomes outsized, my anxiety is just flaring up, I must remember just who God is. And that is why David continues in this section. Verse 12, he says, I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart. What has he just prayed for? I want a unified heart. And what am I going to do with that unified heart? I'm going to give thanks to you with my whole being. So now that I've received this unified heart in you, I'm now going to turn all that back towards you in thanksgiving, and I'm going to glorify your name. Well, why is he going to glorify his name? Verse 13, for great is your steadfast love towards me, and you have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Again, we have those echoes of Exodus 34, 6 there. For great is your steadfast love towards me. And David is praising God. He said, because I know I was destined for death, and you have raised me to life. And for that, I will praise you all my life. And so David has concluded this section of reminding himself who God is. He started with all his prayers, like, Lord, I need you. <laughs> Incline your ear, answer me. And then he's reminding himself of who God is. And now where do we end? We, we end back with more petitions, more prayer requests from David. But I, but I think there's, again, a, a pattern for us to notice here. Because now David is looking at his problems through the lens of truth and who God is. And so we even hear a little bit difference in the, the language. He said, oh God, verse 14, oh God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life and they do not set you before them. What's David saying here? He's saying there's, there's men here that are coming after me that don't play by your rules. They're not just in their thinking. They're, they're evil. They're distorted in their thinking. And they're coming after me. And they actually want to take my life. And we could just stop right there. And that could feel overwhelming. But where does David go with this? He reminds himself again. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. The problem hasn't gone away. But David is rooting himself, not in the problem, but in his position before God. God, these people are coming after me and they're unjust. They have no reason for what they're doing. And it's keeping me up at night. I'm anxious about it. I'm stewing on it all the time. And, and what does he take with this, this false way of living? He, he girds it with truth. But you, O oh Lord, are God merciful and gracious. You are slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. You have not forgotten me and I know who you are and I'm going to live within your bounds. I'm not going to play by their rules. I'm going to live by your rules because your voice is the one that matters in my life. Verse 16, turn to me and be gracious to me. Give, me, uh, give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. I can't do this on my own. I need you. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, O oh Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Again, David ends this, this prayer of petition 
seeking God's intervention. I need you to act. I need you to show yourself. I need your grace. I need your kindness. I need your strength. I need your rescue. I need your sign. I mean, no less than 15 times, David is coming with a laundry list of things. Right? Some of you feel like that's, that's my prayer. I've actually got 20 things that I could bring before the Lord, right? We've all got that. But he's coming before them and he's seeking and he's pursuing these problems, these things coming against him, uh, not in his own strength, but he's uniting his heart, his mind before the Lord. Again, he's, he's walking in God's way. He's living in this way, not just for a moment, but as a lifestyle. David is giving us a pattern and a prayer to follow after. Because again, what do we know? Or at least I think we're discovering that we can't do this on our own. Some of you have tried really hard to carry some pretty heavy loads on your own. To process through some things by yourself and be like, I can just, I can get through this. I'll be fine, right? Right? Just so you know, whenever anyone says, no, I'm fine. They're not fine. They're not fine. We need help. We need someone outside of ourselves with all the things that are bearing down on us. And David is pointing us to the one who is the source of our strength. But, but here's also the beauty of where we stand. David was looking towards a day. David was looking towards a day when a king would come that would set all things right. David was looking towards a day when God would not just point us in the direction, but he would give us a new heart and he would transform us entirely. We stand on that side of things. We stand on the other side of the cross and the way of Jesus. And what David prayed for in verse 11 was a unified heart that was held together in God. It was to look at all things that came his way uh, through the lens of God and his work. But again, we know we, we can't, we can do that for short spurts, but we can't do it for the long haul. This takes uh, something greater, something that other prophets spoke of. Uh, The prophet Ezekiel would speak to this very thing in Ezekiel verse 11, verse 19, it'll be up on the screen. It says, I will give them. One heart and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. God was giving a promise. There's a day coming when I am going to transform you. I will give you a new heart and my spirit will reside in you, strengthening you and enabling you to unite your heart to fear my name. Prophet Jeremiah, he says this in Jeremiah 32, verse 39, I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. I will make with them an everlasting covenant, an agreement between two parties, one greater party by blood, that I will not turn away from doing good to them. And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. I will rejoice in doing them good and I will plant them in the land in faithfulness with all my heart and with all of my soul. We see this pattern throughout scripture that God was continually giving his presence to his people. Adam and Eve dwelt in the garden with him and it was good until they rebelled. And then God frees his people once again. And what does he want to do? He wants to sit down right in the middle of them with the tabernacle. That his presence would reside among them. Later there would be a permanent structure of the temple. That God would reside his presence there. That people could meet with him and experience him. But he still was not satisfied. And so he sent his son. That we may know what the good way looks like. The way of the Lord and walk in it. That Jesus would live the righteous life that we could never live on our own. That he would overcome our sin and our sorrow and our shame. He would die in our place for the the wage that we owe. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin, death. Jesus paid for all of that on our behalf. All who trust in Jesus, God looks at them and sees Jesus' righteousness. So he paves this way. But what's even more? It's Jesus says, it's better for me to go away. Why? Because I'm going to send the advocate, the comforter, who will reside with you and in you. 
And so we have this beautiful moment in Acts where the Spirit of God now comes upon his people. And the presence of God is no longer in buildings of stone, but it is in our very flesh and bone that he resides with us, guiding and leading and speaking to us, empowering and equipping us. This is the new and everlasting covenant that the prophets spoke of, that David longed to see and that we get to step in and experience. And so this is the way forward. To follow in the footsteps of Jesus. To walk as he walked, to love as he loved, to live as he lived. He showed us what oneness with God looked like. He showed us in the midst of uh, his full schedule that he was still very present with those around him. And the voice that mattered most to Jesus was the will of his father because he united his heart to fear his name and show us what that looked like. And he also gave us some help. Because in the course of scripture, we see a lot of rules and we see a lot of ways in which we are to go. And and God in his kindness said, this is the way to to live and follow me. But we're like, man, that got compiled into 613 laws. And that just feels overwhelming, right? Most of us in here can't even pay attention to the speed limit. Now, how are we going to do a 613 laws? Jesus says, here's what's required of you. To love God first and foremost and to love others. You love God, you unite your heart to fear his name, love God, and in your love of God, it will spill over in your love of others. And how do you show your love for God? By loving others. And how do you love others? By loving God. This is where Jesus pointed us to and invites us into. And so how do we begin to unite our hearts to fear his name? Well, we need to order our our thoughts, our schedules, our inputs, our outputs. We must unite our heart to fear his name. To live in in awe of him in all that we do. So how do we do this? David's given us a pretty good roadmap. I think we learn, we live, and we love. What do I mean by that? What did David say? He said, teach me your way. That we need to learn from the rhythms of Jesus what it looks like to be fully human. What does it look like to be a fully alive human being living in the will of God? That's our pattern. It's Jesus. We chase after him. We learn from him. And there's some things that we're like, man, that seems really hard. Yeah. Thankfully, his spirit resides in us and can empower us and equip us to follow after him. So teach me your way and that we would learn from him that I may walk in your truth. That we have to live this truth out. We, get, we have to begin practicing this. Not just hoarding this, but practicing this truth. Not just knowing the truth, but living the truth. And then we love. We unite our hearts to fear God's name. We ask him to give us a singular heartbeat for him. That we would love him. And in return of our love of him, we would better love those around us. Now, we start here as our our priority, aimed at Jesus, and then we work backwards. The problem is, for most of us, we don't think like this. We just try to cram Jesus into our busy schedule. And we're like, well, he'll fit somewhere, and he's gracious and merciful, so he's fine. No, he's the king of all kings. One day, every knee will bow before him. And so, we should make him priority in all that we do. For some of you, that means looking at your schedule and being like, I just, church is about it for me, hear from him. Maybe I should spend some more time with him. Maybe I need to schedule that in. For some of you, uh, bringing all things under one thing, and that's bringing all things under Jesus, that may mean looking at the things that you're consuming, that are shaping your mind, the things you're reading, the the shows you're watching, the intake of uh, news and doom and gloom and all those things that are, are affecting your mind more than you realize. And you may go, uh, I have given this, uh, little attention, and I'm filling my stuff with other, my mind with other things. Come back to this. Come back to this. Turn off the TV. I know it can be hard because we all want to just veg and just kind of sit and be, right? I, I understand that. I live that. Probably too much, confessions of a pastor. Come back to this. Prioritize this. 
Allow this to shape your thinking. And then for others of you, you, you might be this deep well, this reservoir that has just been stockpiling as you just have searched the scriptures and your prayer life is incredible, but you're not pouring out anywhere. You're not giving of yourself anywhere. And God's inviting you to pour into the lives of others. This love that you've received from God is not meant to stay here. It's meant just to burst out of you. And so maybe you need to step out and start practicing and prioritizing that. But I will tell you the truth is that for each of us, the first step that we must do is to come to Jesus and to place ourselves under him. Recognize his lordship, his majesty in our lives and say yes to him in all things. And when we forget to say yes to him because other voices are telling us to say yes to them, we we turn, we repent, we change direction back towards him. And we chase after him. Recognizing that he is who we need. So this morning as we close... We're going to take some time in worship, and we're going to take communion. But this morning, I know we, we haven't always done this. I, I'd like to do communion together as one. And so if you didn't grab that and you came in, you can feel free to grab that and, and have that, or maybe grab it for your neighbor too, check with them. But as we enter in this time of reflection and turning our attention towards him, I'm going to put Psalm 8611 on the screen as our prayer. And I'm going to pray this over us. And then I'm going to encourage you as we step into this time of reflection to pray this. Just come before the Lord. Allow him to examine your heart and just say, Lord, would you teach me your way that I may walk in your truth? Would you unite my heart to fear your name? And just ask him, where where are other places that maybe you're fearing something else besides him? Allow him to speak to you in this time. So let me pray for us, and then I'm going to invite the worship team up. We're going to sing, and then I'll come up, and I'll lead us through communion together. Father, we thank you for your mercy, for your grace, for your steadfast, loyal love. Lord, we are prone to wander, we are quick to forget. And so in these moments, we come open-handed. And Lord, as we come before you, we just grab the words of David and we pray them again. Lord, teach us your ways that we may walk in your truth. And God, unite our hearts to fear your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we acknowledge that our sins, they are many, but your mercy is more. For you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Would you unite our hearts to fear your name? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, before uh, we get out of here. If, if you just need anyone to pray alongside you, we would love to pray with you. We'll be up front. Um, but as you head out, if, if you go into the lobby, uh, there's a place to sign up for home groups. If you've never thought of that or you just thought, I don't know, our home groups are designed for a young, old, single, married. Um, and some of you, I know you're worried that like, am I going to get in the weird group? Um, you you are, because people are there. And as I told first service, we're all pretty weird. So um, you're, you're going to be in good company. But try it out. You can do that in the back. And then I also just want to remind you, uh, awesome opportunity this Friday night to go on down to Missions Coffee at 7 o'clock to hear uh, Grayson's new, new album, um, which is available. We've got it in the back. We've got it in the coffee shop. If you haven't grabbed that yet, you just need to get that on play because it'll just uh, take you to the throne over and over again. Uh, but just will be a fun night of getting to hear the stories behind the songs, but also worshiping together. So that's 7 o'clock down at Missions and hope to see you all there. Uh, Missions, if you go down 49, uh, before you get to America's Tires, um, you're going to see missions on your right-hand side. There's a little uh, a sign up there, but it's right off 49, so you can't, well, I would say you can't miss it, but I've missed a lot of things off 49, so <laughs> that's not true. As we leave from here today, 
May you go uh, learning the way of the Lord, walking in his truth and seeking to unite your heart to fear his name. And in doing so, may you know his grace and experience his peace. God bless you. We'll see you next week.